I've written a new book on Marcuse, which will come out with Verso in about a year. In the course of writing the book, I learned quite a bit. Uh, many things I did not understand before have become clear. And with this talk, I intend to explain some of those things, the things uh, that I learned that have to do with Marcuse's theories about technology. But why talk about Marcuse? He's certainly out of fashion, but he is interesting because he did something unusual. He combined the ideas of Husserl and Heidegger, his own teachers, with a Marxist approach to technology. I don't know of anyone else who did something quite like this. This means that Marcuse is unique in bridging the gap between two very different traditions of uh, technology critique. And this has as a consequence that he's able to address political issues that are not well understood in uh, Heideggerian approaches nor in SDS. Particularly, I'm interested in the fact that capitalism does not appear as a central issue for these approaches, whereas I think it obviously is, and uh, uh, is certainly far more consequential than the famous nature-culture divide that has exercised so many critics of, uh, cap of modernity in recent years. So Marcuse proposed three different critiques of technology. They're related but different. There are two social critiques, and I'll talk about them first. The first critique is summarized in his aphorism, technology is ideology. Now, what can he mean by this? I think the most basic point that he's trying to make is that technology is not neutral. It's not simply a neutral instrument that uh, responds to our will, but it has its own significance for the things that we think we do, can do, and the things we do do. Technology frames a whole way of life, and it legitimates that way of life because our concern with efficiency and with the effective mastery of natural forces is a central uh, concept in modern uh, societies and technology appears to serve that, uh, that interest. And this leads, Marcuse argues, to the triumph of technical thinking, what he calls one-dimensional thinking, in which everything is viewed as a technical problem and the work of uh, politics is undermined, the normative concerns of politics are undermined, and for them are substituted technical problem solving within the given framework. So that's the first critique. The second critique he developed in his essay on Max Weber's theory of rationalization. Marcuse argued that when Weber talked about rationalization, he was really talking about capitalist rationalization without actually understanding that this limited his concept Rationalization, Weber says, is calculation and control. Calculation and control by whom? Calculation and control of whom? Those are the questions that Weber did not adequately address. Under a capitalist system, the calculation and control is handed over to people exterior to the work process, capitalists and their managers. And so the uh, effective result is that the, the work is organized from above, not by the common agreement of the people who do the work, but by uh, people outside the work process who impose their will on it. And that has consequences for the nature of work and for the kind of things that are produced in the economy, which Weber was unable to criticize and theorize because he just took it for granted that this is the way things get done. So this is the second critique then, which Marcuse also extended to technical reason as a whole and to technology under capitalism, both of which he saw as biased by capitalist, unacknowledged capitalist 
uh, premises. So those are the two social critiques. But there's a third, much more complex ontological critique. And this critique is developed in One Dimensional Man, uh, especially in the later chapters. And by ontology, we mean what is real. So the question that Marcuse poses in his discussion of science and technology in One Dimensional Man is what is real. And what is real, of course, not in some absolute sense, but in the society in which we live. Now, at the time he was writing, physics appeared as the paradigmatic science. If you wanted to know what science was, you looked to physics. And physics is uh, special because it treats the world in terms of a very limited number of aspects. Essentially, what can be reduced to primary qualities, to measurable um, uh, weights and measures and weights and, and motions and uh, uh, other fundamental uh, physical qualities. Uh, now, this is there's nothing wrong with physics, but if these limitations are uh, imported into everyday experience, that experience becomes severely limited and important aspects of experience are lost. And Marcuse again uses the term one dimensional to describe the kind of thinking that results from the uh, intrusion of what are properly scientific ideas about the nature of reality into our everyday experience. And he explained this in terms of a, a unique synthesis of phenomenology and Marxism. So <clears throat> he's, he draws on Husserl's theory of science. Uh, Husserl argued that science arises from the life world, the everyday world of uh, ordinary experience. Science uh, picks up ideas, concepts from the life world and refines them, makes them more precise, and develops them into instruments of scientific knowledge. But ultimately, science depends on the life world for the source of its uh, concepts. Now, with the, to this, Marcuse added ideas from Heidegger's later theory of technology as a system of domination. And Heidegger, uh, uh, Heidegger's theory is, in a way, similar to what I just described as Marcuse's view of the importation of uh, ideas from physics into everyday experience. The world appears uh, in Heidegger's understanding of modern experience as a system of resources available for control and domination by uh, human subjects. So in a sense, you can see here a kind of reciprocity between Husserl's theory of science arising from the life world Heidegger's theory of technology as domination, uh, qualities uh, valued in science becoming uh, practical in everyday experience. Well, Marcuse synthesized these theories with Sartre's notion of the project. Now, in, in Sartre's existential phenomenology, a project is not a particular plan. It's a scene on which plans can be plausibly uh, uh, devised and implemented. So if you think of the capitalist system as having a project in this sense, it defines a specific life world. The life world uh, of capitalism is one in which, Marcuse will argue, science reflects and determines the nature of experience. Okay, so this is the ontological critique, and uh, it has, for Marcuse, a, a fundamental consequence. Because when science defines the life world, the life world changes. It's no longer a space in which people apprehend the potentialities of other human beings, of themselves and their objects. What do we mean by potentialities? Well, I mean, it's pretty self-evident. Uh, children grow, and everybody is aware when they see a child that it's a growing entity. Forests flourish uh, unless you cut down all the trees, 
and uh, so on. So uh, we see nature and we see other human beings in terms of not only what they are in the moment, uh, not only in terms of what we could measure, say, in a scientific sense right now, but also in terms of what they are developing toward, what they can become. What, uh, so again, when you meet up with an old friend, you think, is he looking healthy? Is he looking uh, depressed? Is he happy? What's happening with him? In other words, you see well beyond the immediate facts. Well, these, these um, aspects of reality that are available in everyday experience are useless for natural science. Physics has to eliminate all of this stuff in order to get at what it can use as facts in its, and data in its, uh, in its work. So if the physical uh, ontology, the, physics, the ontology of physics penetrates into ex experience, that means the, that uh, potentialities are eliminated, not just from science, but also from experience itself. Well, what happens then when we see experience largely in terms of a quasi-scientific uh, ontology? Well, at that point, our projects no longer uh, interact with what we perceive as the potentialities of our objects. Instead, we relate to those objects through values, what we can call subjective values. And these values in our everyday life are um, the products of our psychology, our background, and so on. All that is certainly part of our everyday experience, but it is modulated by our sense of the potentialities of our uh, fellow human beings and nature. However, if this becomes then the dominant um, ideology of a whole society, then those values will be determined by the dominant powers in that society. And in the case of capitalist society, that means corporations and the government agencies that act for them. So this, this leads Marcuse finally to a kind of dystopian conclusion. And this is a real 60s phenomenon. There were many movies, for example, in the 60s which depicted dystopias. Um, uh, the most famous, I guess, is La Dolce Vita, Fellini. But there's also Fahrenheit 451, Alpha Vin, many other films in which you see a society that is completely locked down and controlled by technology, by uh, a sort of brave new world or 1984 uh, logic of social life. Of course, the interesting paradox that results from this um, is that the dystopian films and popular culture and uh, even philosophical texts like Marcuse's One Dimensional Man provoked resistance to dystopia. So this is the interesting paradox that led in, uh, that was one of the sources of the new left. Okay, now Marcuse was not content with simply criticizing. He also uh, as a Marxist, had uh, ideas about the future. He imagined socialism as a alternative civilizational project, a different project from capitalism, that would produce a different science and a different technology. So you can see from this that his his uh, ontology is basically constructivist because he doesn't he doesn't argue that there's a single type, a single um, uh, definition of the real. Rather, they're alternative definitions which depend on social uh, forces. So, and when you apply this to the problem of science, it gives you an interesting uh, point of view on the future of science. Sciences have specific objects. No science concerns all and everything. That would be impossible and absurd. So, uh, Physics concerns matter in motion. That's its object. It's not the same as the object of biology, which is living things. It's a different object. And these objects have traditionally been viewed as in the nature of the science itself. But Marcuse is arguing that they are, uh, that the sciences are contingent on historical conditions. 
So the objects themselves then would be contingent. If the life world changes, and remember for Husserl, the life world is the source of scientific concepts, then presumably the objects of science would change as well. Now the object of physics is the primary qualities of nature. What would the new science have as a new object under socialism? That's the question with which he concludes uh, his book, One Dimensional Man, his famous book. Now you have to put this in a, a social context. Uh, at the time when Marcuse was writing, in, this, in the early 60s, there were really no significant struggles over technology and science. Uh, science and technology were idealized in the United States to a, a, an unusual degree, very different from today when there's so much contention. Uh, only in the late 70s do you begin to get an environmental movement that's strong enough to make an impact on uh, people like Marcuse who are thinking about politics. But even so, he was, uh, toward the end of his life, he did not go back and revise his earlier theories of science and technology. He endorsed the environmental movement, but within the framework of those theories. He, he argued that a new science would incorporate potentialities, um, and presumably he was, I mean, toward the end of his life, he was thinking about environmental issues, and so he saw nature as having potentialities favorable to human life that were being destroyed by industry, and uh, he thought that a new science would have to learn how to incorporate those potentialities in its structure. At the same time, in One Dimensional Man, where he first mentions this prospect uh, in, a, in a very uh, abstract, vague way, he does reject the idea of returning to a qualitative science. So he, it's not back to Aristotle, no new age stuff. He believes that science will remain a essentially quantitative study uh, based on precise measurement and the under, uh, an objective understanding of uh, the world, but he sees it as somehow incorporating secondary qualities. Again, in, in none, no, no text really explains how this would work. He talks about a combination of science and art, uh, things of this sort, which remain quite vague. There's one concept, though, which he introduces in One Dimensional Man that I think has uh, significance for us still, and that's the notion of translation. He argues that these secondary qualities can be translated into scientific terms in a new way. But exactly how that would work, he doesn't know, he can't explain in, uh, in his writings. So I, I want to uh, work off this basic notion of translation and uh, successor science. Um, but in, in a way that is a little different from Marcuse's. We'll see, I'll show you how. First of all, consider that uh, we live in a modern society and it is therefore a technified world. Um, our society, and this I think is all uh, in accord with what Marcuse is arguing in One Dimensional Man, our society is organized basically by technical disciplines, what we now can call technosciences. These technosciences structure what I'll call the techno system. That is to say, the system of institutions and organizations and technical uh, and, and technologies that uh, define our condition in a modern uh, technified world. Now we've seen that there's translations between the life world and the objects of science in Marcuse's theory but he doesn't extend this to technology. He doesn't actually develop any sort of a theory of uh, how the critique of technosciences could lead to successor technosciences. So for example, he talks about uh, management as Weber describes it, but he doesn't give us a theory of a new type of management that would be a rational form of self-management for a worker-controlled uh, society. 
So this raises a question. There's a lacuna in Marcuse's theory. What would successor technosciences be like? And remember, these are the sciences that actually organize everything. Uh, not, physics is only a servant of these many sciences, such as engineering, uh, um, I mean, you could go on criminology, dietetics. Uh, there, there are dozens of these architecture that there are dozens of these sciences that organize everything around us. So we need a new management theory if we were going to be consistent and pursue the successor science idea for the techno sciences as well as for physics. And this would also apply to technological design. The designs of the technologies around us would also have to change in some way that would be uh, made relevant by uh, a changed life world. So you can, here's an example, take air pollution. Um, what has actually happened to the automobile? Well, it's been redesigned. So now it is a different thing than it was before. There was a time before people cared about air pollution when the automobile was simply a means of transportation and a status object, but we have now changed it into a new kind of object, uh, at least from the engineering standpoint, that is not only a means of transportation and a status object, but also an environmental object, an, envir an object that is, uh, uh, has environmental uh, obligations. So, I mean, that's a kind of simple example of the sort of thing that Marcuse could have worked out had he pursued his notion of successor science in relation to the techno sciences. Well, this is uh, highly relevant today because unlike in the 1960s when Marcuse was working out his theory, today there's a great deal of contestation of science. Um, Science is no longer sacrosanct. Technology is no longer viewed as uh, saving humanity. Although, of course, in some instances, we do have, uh, depend, have to depend on it. But there's still a lot of criticism. And this criticism needs a theory. Now, I think Marcuse offers the elements for a critical politics of technology, even though he didn't work that out in any detail himself. In a sense, you could say his critique of science and technology is a kind of anticipation of current struggles, which address issues that, uh, that he announced in his, in his work long before they became public issues. I've been working on this question in recent years, and in my book, Technosystem, I develop a uh, a theory of how we can understand the politics of technoscience in terms of something not unlike Marcuse's synthesis of phenomenology and Marxism. I, I'll take it for granted that he's right that life, world, and sciences interact practically, uh, uh, conceptually, but also practically. And uh, this takes the form in a politics of technology of life world concerns being communicated to experts. So if, say in the case of air pollution, which I mentioned earlier, public concern about the health effects of air pollution eventually reached automotive engineers who re-engineered the automobile to take account of those concerns. And this is a pattern which appears over and over again in uh, recent years, in the last, say, 40, 50 years, as environmental concerns, environmental concerns become more and more uh, significant, and uh, also concerns in other fields like medicine, for example, begin to spill over into the public and affect, ultimately affect the uh, scientific uh, ideas about how to do things, for example, uh, how to handle childbirth, uh, uh, which has been deeply uh, implicated in feminist concerns about uh, medicine. So th this process of communication is, of course, two-way, because people in the life world are influenced by scientific concepts, which enable them to understand their experience. 
say in the case of climate change, very few people today uh, consider it to be God's punishment for uh, accepting homosexuality. Most of us take it for granted that it's the result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we learn that from scientists. So our conception of the climate is influenced by science, but the science is also influenced by pressures from the life world, pressures to figure out what's going on and to figure out how to mitigate these effects. Of course, we cannot forget the role of capitalism in all this. There are obstacles to overcome because the experts are employed by corporations and by governments, and uh, they have been so employed for generations and have accumulated in their technical disciplines various biases that stem from the uh, priorities of these uh, social organizations. Uh, and uh, even today, experts face obstacles in trying to answer public concerns uh, because they are bound to, uh, bound to serve their masters, their corporate and government masters. And these obstacles are overcome through struggles, political struggles that take place in the public sphere and that have transformed uh, the public sphere in recent years into a domain of technical, uh, of, of technical concern. So this is a way of drawing out some of Marcuse's ideas into the current uh, situation. We can see that the objects of the techno sciences are modulated, altered by life world concerns and public protests based on those concerns. In that sense, we could say that, say, these are successor techno sciences. Of course, not as radically different, perhaps, as Marcuse's imagined physics, but significantly different, different enough to make a big difference in the quality of life in our technified society. Of course, there is one big difference between this view that I've developed uh, in part on the basis of Marcuse's work and his own, his own theory. Because in his theory, the big changes could only occur after a socialist revolution, which modified the structure of the life world to bring back a sense of potentialities lost in the dystopia of one dimensionality. In fact, we've seen that there is no such dystopia, that the life world has retained to a greater degree than Marcuse believed uh, likely or possible, a sense of uh, potentiality, and that uh, motivates struggles to preserve and protect the potentials of both human beings and nature uh, in these movements that I've been discussing. So we have not had to wait for a socialist revolution. We can alter the techno sciences now. Uh, and so we can, quoting Marx, say, hic rotus, hic salta. Uh, 